No, it's not on? No, it's on. Okay, now it's on. Do we need it? Yes, yes we need it, I think. Okay. My name is Suzanne Wasserman. I'm the director of the Gotham Center for New York City History here at the CUNY Graduate Center. Please join us for our next forum on November 19th. Downstairs in the Siegel Theater, Clint Johnson is going to speak about a vast and fiendish plot, the Confederate attack on New York City. 150 years ago, Manhattan almost wiped from the from the map in what could have been the worst terrorist attack in world history, when eight Confederate officers failed miserably to burn down the city on November 25th, 1864. Had they scouted better targets or made better use of the chemical weapons they carried, firefighters would have been overwhelmed and hundreds of thousands would have burned to death. Come hear the true story of how New York ignored clear warnings from the federal government about about impending attack and how local, state, and national politicians may have aided the Confederates in the attack. Today, without further ado, let me introduce our speaker, Graham Hodges. Tonight, Graham is going to speak about the Chinese-American actress Anna Mae Wong. Anna Mae Wong remains the ultimate Asian-American film star, having appeared in over 50 films with such legends as Douglas Fairbanks, Senor Ramon Navarro, Joan Crawford, L Leanne Cheney, Marilyn Diedrich, Marlene Diedrich, Sesu Hayakawa, Werner Olin, and many others. Despite being forced to play degrading roles, Wong's global fame crystallized the image of the Asian woman in the first half of the 20th century. Please join me in welcoming Graham Russell Gale Hodges for a brief introduction to her life, focusing on her stage and vaudeville career, and her innumerable friendships among New York's intellectual and artistic communities. Graham Russell Gale Hodges is a professor of piano studies at including one on taxi drivers and on Cartman, both of which were presented here at the Gotham Forum. The Cartman video is available on C-SPAN 3. Hodges is now working on a history of black New Jersey, 1664 to 2014. And this is also being recorded, so if anyone's interested in looking at this later, it'll be online. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Suzanne. It's uh, always great to be here. As, as she said, it's my third time. Uh, and it's a really nice opportunity to interact with my favorite people, New Yorkers. I lived here for many, many years. I still have a residence. Well, I kind of regard myself as a tourist because I'm not really that aware of what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, tonight, I would like to talk about Anna Mae Wong um, and her career and her importance. I first did this book 10 years ago. Uh, it was published in around the time of uh, sort of the resurgence of interest in Anna Mae. Uh, and then the book drifted out of print, but I was fortunate enough to have Hong Kong University Press bring it back in print. Uh, a new edition, I also went back and edited it, corrected mistakes, added new material, okay, because Anna Mae Wong remains a deeply fascinating person for me. Okay. I first discovered her through this picture. I was botanizing along Cecil Court uh, of Sharing Cross in London, and I saw this picture in a bookstore window, and I was really transfixed. So I went in and bought it, it was not cheap. And I said, what am I doing? Okay. Um, and at this time, I was just beginning to discover the internet. This is 1999. Um, and I began to look her up, and I went, this person's really something very important. And I started buying things. Fortunately, uh, an editor uh, from Palgrave fixated my, uh, was able to deal with my fixation and published it. Uh, this is the new edition with the image by Lottie Jacoby. Uh, I like this one very much. Uh, and then uh, this is the Chinese version, which is a cover which I also uh, like a, a whole lot. So when I publish this book, I emphasize very heavily the racism that Anna Mae had to face. You know, that she was this brilliant actress uh, who could not graduate to the lead role because she couldn't kiss a Caucasian on screen. So she was limited to roles as a dragon lady as a China doll. As she said, I died in every movie. <laughs> hey, uh, she died a thousand times. She had a terrific humor. And she did maintain her f fame and her career at a time when 
The studios didn't really need her. They were using yellow face actors, Caucasians dressed up, and I'll show you an example of that in a little while, uh, by pinning their eyes back uh, with, with tape, okay, uh, by putting different kinds of rouge on. Okay. Those actors, actresses could then kiss the lead uh, and therefore uh, co-star. Now, anime was not allowed to do that. Okay? And of course, this kept her career from really taking off. Okay? So uh, these are some of the first images that I encountered of her, and I thought we'd just sort of share some of these. I'll play some clips for you uh, and give some, maybe some new insights. The title of my book is Anime Wong from Laundryman's Daughter to Hollywood Legend. And Anna May uh, is, was born in 1905, uh, most of her career, she shaved off two years when she first moved to London. Okay? But this is her family with her father, uh, Wong Sam Singh, who is the uh, older man in the picture, okay? uh, her brothers, and, and her sister uh, Lulu, and her younger sister uh, Anna. Okay? Uh, at their family, and Anna born in 1905, the second daughter. Uh, Wong Sam Singh had a son in China whom he had left behind because he wanted to come to America. He had a wife, and we'll also see a picture of them in just a moment. Okay? But he was very frustrated because he had two daughters. He was looking for an American son, okay? although it would be an alleged American son because at that time, first few decades of the 20th century, even though Anna May was third generation American, she was referred to in documents as an alleged American. Her birth was not really considered to be trustworthy. Okay? And that she would have to get, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, permission every time she came back into the country. She was not a full-fledged citizen. So this is one picture of the family. And there's, here is a, 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 a charcoal drawing of Wong Sam Singh. This was done in the 1890s uh, near Taishan, in Guangdong province. Uh, I have this because... Uh, anime, as I said, had two sides of a family, one American, one Chinese. Okay? The American family would not cooperate. They were deeply ashamed of her. Okay? They felt that she had disgraced the family okay? by becoming an actress, by coming, having affairs, by living the life of a pretty liberated woman in the 1920s, rather than, as her father had wished, marrying one of his cohorts in the laundry business. But the Chinese family proved very open to me, and they still remain very, very close friends of mine. And as a result, we have these drawings, first of Wong Sam Sin. Okay? Here's Lee Gan Toy, his American wife, uh, who was born here in San Francisco, the daughter of cigar makers. But this is Lee Shi, his first wife, whom he married about 1888, had a son, this man, Huang Dunan, okay? and then Wong Simpson said, let's go back to go to America. She said, I don't want to go. I want to preserve the family in China. Okay? So he left her behind and married a Li Gan Toy. But every month, especially after anime got into the movie business, the family sent money back. And this man was educated at Waseda University in Tokyo, uh, became really a leader in Guangdong uh, politics and society, uh, and had several wives, and I'm very, very close with uh, one of his daughters uh, and, and, and his, one of his, uh, his uh, granddaughters. Okay. Uh, we also have this picture. This is of Mary, who was an actress. Uh, had a tragic end uh, that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Okay. But her father was really critically important. This is a picture taken uh, near the family homestead uh, near Taishan. I was there. It was really quite an overwhelming experience to go there. I, I was so taken by the occasion that I had to borrow a cigarette from the driver to calm down. Uh, because it was just today, it's like that today, just as it was 75 or 80 years ago when Anna Mae visited her father there. And we'll see a little picture of that in a little while. Okay, uh, but it's because of Hollywood that we know her. It's because of all of these magazine articles, pictures that are everywhere in the 1920s and 1930s, because anime was a big, big star. Okay? But, as I said, she starts off, and it's kind of interesting, by, in the, in the films, by going, learning about silent films by walking through sets, 
done on the streets of downtown Los Angeles. Okay? So as she goes to school, she's sort of walking in and out of reality. And she's deeply captivated by the flickers. She takes tip money that she earns from delivering laundry uh, and uses it to, go to, to sneak out of school to go to the movies. She becomes hopelessly entranced uh, with the perils of Pauline. And she, at home, she and Lulu would practice acting on the bed with their small dolls. Okay. Eventually, she starts hanging around more and more, be referred to as the curious Chinese child. Okay. Uh, and by the late teens, uh, she makes her debut in an Ali, Ala Nazimova movie, okay. uh, and then more and more bit parts. And then finally, by 1920, she gets a lead in this one. But here you can see the dilemma. Here she's acting as Lon Chaney Sr.'s wife. Okay. And she will be tortured in this. Okay. That's her role. Fortunately, Lon Chaney liked her very much, looked after her, okay, promoted her career. He was a very good friend of her. And she found in the business of Hollywood that she could work well with certain actors. Okay. And so this one, Alan Cheney, really was quite helpful for her during the 1920s. Okay. Uh, she also remained friends with Nazimova, who was in the Red Lantern. She had a sort of the scandalous affair with Mickey Nealon, who directed this film. Okay. Uh, but she got around. Now, the next role, and we'll see if we can get this right here, uh, is in th this film. This is The Toll of the Sea. It's one of the very first, if not the first, Technicolor movies. Okay? Uh, and in this adaptation of Madame Butterfly, which, as I argue in the book, is the ultimate in the Orientalist perception of Asia. Okay? Of course, this is still a very popular opera. It's done at the Met all the time. Okay? But this is a play, and here we're going to see uh, Raymond Carver tell uh, Lotus Flower he, she cannot go back. Here, anime demonstrates one of the real talents on command. So he's telling her he's not going to take her back to the United States. They have a child, but he's going to leave him behind. One of the other things I try to take note of in this is how she she pulls her hands. Much of this has been done in the way of taking off. This is actually one Okay, so she's now been told that she's been left behind, breaking her heart, and so there's the tear. Not many actors do that on command. Perhaps it was because we can do one of the gone off back to his wife. Uh, perhaps it's because these men were unfaithful to her, but she somehow summoned up that feeling. Okay. Um, now, Frances Marion directed this movie. She's a pioneering female director, one of the very first, okay. and very close friends with the golden couple, uh, Douglas Fairbanks Sr. and Mary Pickford. So when Douglas Fairbanks Sr. begins casting for The Thief of Baghdad, the great hit of 1924. I think it's in the National Treasury of Films that we have. Okay. Uh, he needs Anna Mae Wong to play the role of the servant. Okay. And here we see a very famous pinup scene uh, in which Fairbanks will then stick a knife into her lower back to intimidate her to make sure that she does what he wants. Okay. That image circulates the globe. I've seen examples of it from Australia, from Russia, from England, of course, America. Everybody knew who she was through this role, okay, but also from her succeeding role with, uh, in, in Peter Pan, the first version with Betty Bronson, in which she plays Tiger Lily. Okay. So she's become quite famous uh, in uh, her career, but at the same time, there are powerful limits to her. Okay. She cannot get the lead roles. Okay. What happens to her, and throughout this period, she makes probably four or five movies a year. And this is, again, the business part, because I'm an old labor historian. I pay a lot of attention to this kind of thing. They would use her name on the marquee, 
but include her only for short sections of the film, pay her by the day, and so while she would be one of the key attractions for the movie, she might make on $100 or so, uh, pittance. Whereas white actresses were making far, far more uh, acting in yellow face. Okay. She also becomes pretty famous as a, uh, a flapper. I'm going to go up to this one here. Here we see her in a very fashionable dress. She's one of the first to wear kulaks. Okay. Uh, she also dresses in her father's mo uh, wedding coat, okay, ad adapts it for herself. We'll see more pictures demonstrating that. That, uh, that sensibility. But let me go back to the previous one here. Yes, this one. Um, this is a very interesting document which speaks to the personal dilemma she has as an American. Okay. This is the per permit that is required of her to leave the country and return. Again, she's third generation American. But she would have to go down and speak to a guy named James C. Nardini. Nardini. The whole family would have to go down. Those who are familiar at all with Asian American history know about the, the interviews that immigrants would have uh, at Angel Island in San Francisco, okay, where <coughs> inspectors would try to determine if this person really was who he or she said they were. She would have to do this every time she left the country, and it was not a small business. On one occasion, she forgot to meet Nardini. He read the newspaper she was going to leave for Europe, and so he telegraphs her and says, don't go anywhere. Okay. It will not be until the late 1930s that she's able to get an American passport. Okay. Uh, and even on, you know, until the uh, end of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1943, that she actually will become a full-fledged citizen, despite the fact that she was born here. So these documents and their it is an endless trail for each one of them. I found these down at the National Archives in uh, Laguna Niguel. There are others up in San Francisco and Seattle, wherever she happened to go through uh, uh, the entry port. Okay? Uh, and again, they testify to the close-knit family relationship because they had to go down with her and say, all right, yes, she was in this place last month. Okay? Uh, she went to this school. Okay? Uh, I know her. I mean, there had to be testimonials constantly. Okay? But Anna May decided to make a, very, a major decision. She was interested in going to China, known about when Wu Liandi, who is the editor of Huang Yuluabo, which is the famous Chinese women's magazine of that period, uh, comes to visit. Um, he gets her to autograph this and puts it on the front cover. That means he's known all around China, but with mixed perceptions. Okay? The nationalist government is not keen on her and they'll become even more concerned about her in the near future. Okay? But she does have a very sizable fame, especially among the international elite, the ambassadors, the writers, okay? the, uh, the actor Meilan Fan. These people are her friends. The government is not, the government of Chiang Kai-shek. Okay? But what she does is decide to go against the current she and her sister Lulu, uh, who's her older sister, go off to Berlin. Most of European actors are coming to Hollywood. She goes to Berlin at the invitation uh, of Emil Jannings and others okay, to join and make movies in Berlin, Paris, uh, and London. One of the fascinating things I found out about her uh, is that she not only chose to represent China, but she also was one of the very few Chinese in these major centers of modernism. Okay. We think about Weimar, Berlin, about interwar Paris, London, you know, as the hallmarks of artistic modernism. But they knew nothing about China. They knew not, they had very, there were almost no Chinese people living in these cities. There were fewer than 100 Chinese only 30 Chinese women living in Berlin at the time she arrives. So she hits these places like a bomb. Okay? They're very proud that she's coming. This famous actress has come over to, uh, to, to, to Berlin. Okay? And there she encounters uh, this person, these two people. I'm sure you know who the one on the left is. Okay? That's Marlene Dietrich. 
Okay. Uh, there are other images, which I couldn't get a, uh, permission to use here, uh, which show Anna Mae Wong pouring wine into Dietrich's mouth. Okay. And Dietrich's biographers have always presumed that they had an affair. Okay. I think there's probably some truth to that. Okay. After she was able to get rid of Lulu and send her back to the United States, Anna Mae begins to really exercise her rights as a 22-year-old woman and really kind of enjoy herself in the Weimar. The other person, of course, is Leni Riefenstahl, who just recently died, okay, uh, who was an actress at the time. The uh, image is taken at the press ball in early 1928 by Alfred Eisenstadt, uh, the famous photographer takes a bit great picture, you know, of, of the kiss in, in Times Square. So this is an image, and they have these people remain very, very close. Okay, Dietrich and Wong are really good allies, you know, perhaps lovers, but also beyond that. Riefenstahl, I actually sent an email to Riefenstahl, and she answered me. Uh, before, and then I said, "Have you ever seen any moments?" Never, never saw her again. Okay, probably not true. Uh, anyway, here is a picture of Dietrich and Wong together when they make the famous movie Shanghai Express. And then I thought I'd play a little clip. I hope we can get it here. Let's see it coming up. Let's try one more here. No, it's supposed to be right there. Uh, you think you can cover over the images? Pardon? Can you cover over the images, maybe? Uh, oh, yeah, there we go. Thanks. OK, that helps. A little technical advice. Hey, uh, anybody know the movie Shanghai Express? Okay, very famous, right? Okay. Okay, there's Clive Owen. Well, it plays was nice to see you again, Madeline. Dietrich's lover. Oh, I don't know. It's very funny. We also get to hear anime talk. Let's just stay with us for a minute or so. 32, 19, 1932. Notice the uh, record player. The, uh, the two women in the compartment together. Jazz music playing. And this lady then, this, this train of course is a ship of fools. Everybody's corrupt in some way. I beg your gramophone ladies and thought I'd come in and get acquainted if you don't mind. Not at all, come in. It's a bit lonely on the train, isn't it? I'm used to having people around. They put my dog in the baggage car. That's why I dropped him over I've been visiting my niece in Peking. She married a seafaring man. He hasn't been home in four years, and she ain't been very cheerful. I have a boarding house in Shanghai. Yorkshire pudding is my specialty, and I only take the most respectable people. Don't you find respectable people terribly dull? You're joking, aren't you? I only know the most respectable people. You see, I keep a boarding house. What kind of a house did you say? A boarding house. Oh. I'm sure you're very respectable, madam. I must confess, I don't quite know the standard of respectability that you demand in your boarding house, Mrs. Harrington. I made a terrible mistake. i better look after me dog. I beg your pardon? I beg yours. Great scene. Um, people made a lot out of this scene uh, as a suggestion of the intimacy between Dietrich uh, and Wong. Uh, interestingly enough, many people felt that Anna Mae upstaged Dietrich. Throughout this film, Dietrich, and, uh, who plays Shanghai Lil, a woman who's available, uh, and Wong, who plays Hu Fei, who is a prostitute, okay, uh, they are in very close proximity to each other. Okay, um, and there's a great deal of irony to all of this. Now, the one thing that happened, though, is that when this movie was first screened in Shanghai, nationalist critics stood up at the evening show and said, this movie embarrasses China because she's playing a prostitute. Okay? That was the role that she was given by von Stroheim, and this is what they found unacceptable. Okay. So at that point, Paramount is banned from China. This is a major market. Paramount has a very healthy percentage of the Chinese film market in 1932. 
and it took diplomacy, it took over a year to get them back in. What this also said was that the nationalists were very concerned about Anna May's image as a woman of Chinese descent. She violated the new ideal of the new woman, a chaste, educated, patriotic, a married. Anna May was none of those things. And so over and over again, newspaper articles, and I researched these very thoroughly in China with the help of some friends of mine, a, uh, articulated this deep disdain that the nationalist government had for her at the same time peop the ordinary people and the elite, the artistic elite, liked her very, very much. And we'll talk about that again in a few minutes. So it's that she's very popular in Berlin. The French adore her. At one point they say that Joan Crawford, Jeanette MacDonald have come to Paris, but Anna May is the one who's the most Parisian of all of them. They felt that she was deeply cosmopolitan. And so did the English. And now we're going to see something that was the hit of December 1928. This is the movie Piccadilly. It's still available uh, from Milestones. Terrific. This is, this is why Anna Mae went to Europe, so that she could be the lead. Okay? She plays, and I'll show you, this is one of the, also one of the first pictures that really knocked me out, okay? a girl in the scullery. And Jameson Thomas, whom you'll meet in just a moment, is the restaurant owner of the Piccadilly nightclub. Uh, Charles Lawton, in his first role as a drunken customer, finds a spot of dirt on the plate, yells at a big fight right there in the middle of uh, the stage show, okay? goes back to the scullery to find out, and then he finds this. This is why there's dirt, because nobody's paying attention. They're watching uh, Anna Mae Wong dance. Okay? And eventually, of course, as business drops off, Gilda Gray, who invents the, the shimmy, uh, the famous dance of the 1920s, isn't able to bring in the crowds the way she had before. Interesting enough also, what minutes of the crowd, you, you'll see a little bit of that, are English royalty. A, uh, Anna Mae Wong's boyfriend is uh, the top Chinese uh, cook, a restaurateur in, 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 in London. Okay? But here we're going to get, here's, I think these images are great. I've shown these a lot in China, and the young women there really like the fashionable quality of them, especially the one I think on the left. And you can see her as Jameson Thomas offers her an opportunity to, be, to dance uh, at the Piccadilly Club. And then let's uh, watch a little bit of this. I kind of like, this is after she's done it, and they go, go out. for the people who are willing to cross boundaries. Okay. Now, um, also you see a black man dancing. There's an incident that comes up in a couple of moments in which he's dancing with a white woman. And there's a... Uh, uh, pardon? You can't hear me? Okay. Well, there's an incident with a black man who's dancing with a white woman. Okay. Uh, but let me uh, move on. Okay. Uh, there's Anna Mae in, in Chinatown, which of course is very close to Piccadilly. Uh, and then this very interesting image, 
A, uh, first of all, this is undertaken by Edward Steichen. She becomes major focus of artistic photographers. And then this is the one, uh, here she is, plays an on the spot with Crane Wilbur in 1930. One of the things she did was very clever and shows how resourceful she was, you can hear me, okay, is that this is the time of the great transition from silence to talkies. And a number of important stars couldn't make that because their voices turned out to be squeaky, off key or something like that. Anna Mae went up to Cambridge and had a tutorial in diction from one of the professors up there and adapted an English accent, which proved her to be very useful when she got back to the Anglo, uh, Anglophilic states. Okay? But it gave her uh, a sense and allowed her to, to move into the, the talking era uh, with, with, and to, to, to play roles on West One. So she's really a, a major hit. Okay? And this one is also quite fascinating, taken around the same time. Uh, who's the guy on the left? Absolutely. Okay, Robeson is there doing Showboat and Otello. Okay? And the English are like the Americans. Uh, there's a big controversy over whether Otello should kiss Desdemona on stage because he's black. Okay? And Peggy Ashcroft, his opposite, is, is white. Okay? Uh, so Robeson's really, they, they become very, very close friends at this time. The man on the left is also very interesting. Anybody recognize him? Yes. Pardon? He was a major star. Of yeah, this is Melon Fon. He is the. He's not the only star of Peking Opera, but he's generally acknowledged to be at the level of Clark Gable, Gary Cooper, just a very pinnacle of stardom. Okay? And he's on a big tour. You know, come over to the States later. So these are the kind of people she's, she becomes very, very close friends with. Okay? And I make the argument that whether it's the Piccadilly movie or the other lesser movies that she makes there, she always because she has a powerful influence in the making of all of these movies and what goes into the script, how she performs, okay, that there is kind of a cosmopolitan air to it. Okay? Mixed race, multinational, okay? uh, gender uh, crossing. Okay? In every way, she's really a, a very, very modern person. Uh, she also begins to do vaudeville. And I, Suzanne mentioned that I would uh, 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 do a little, talk a little bit about that. She starts doing vaudeville across uh, all of Europe. She there are maps in which we can see that she trans uh, goes up and down the continent. Okay, uh, and she has a monologue uh, that she uses when she roams Europe over the next few years. She goes back to the states, but between 1928 and 1937, she's in Europe about twice as much the time she's in the United States. So her, she has to go back and try to keep her career alive, but she talks about, the sun doesn't shine for a woman like me. My work, you see, begins at night. In winter or summer, if it's raining, thundering, or freezing, for me, it's all the same. I'm waiting for clients. There's a young man from the fleet. Hello, old chap, how's it going? It's good to see you, hurry, let's go, come on. Rich or old, young or poor, all kinds of men, those who cry and those who laugh, they all come by. They come to buy, and since I sell, it's their right. They call this love, but I call it hell. Good evening, sweetie. Are you happy with life? What's going on, little guy? Go ahead, I'm leaving. Long ago, I loved deeply with all my heart. He loved me. It was a passionate love. We weren't going to leave each other ever, ever, ever. Okay? Love was such a beautiful thing. Oh, I'm thinking we were when we were in love, but someday, by chance, I'll meet my lover. Because she's always alone. Okay? She goes through a series of relationships with older, well-placed white men okay, who invariably let her down. Okay. There are probably about five or six that I know very clearly about. Okay. And she believed that this could be something very real. Okay. Now, again, marrying those men was impossible in the United States. It was against the law. Okay. California does not remove its ban on marriage between Asians and whites until 1948, when the famous director James Wong Howe, who was married to Serena Bob, a white woman, traveled, they would have separate hotel rooms and they would sit at separate tables in the, in the, uh, in the restaurant because people would bother them otherwise. <coughs> so anime is really stymied for a, a true relationship. Okay? 
And this personal life reflects the tragedy of her career. Okay? Uh, but she finds succor, I believe, in the international contacts that she has, okay? the friends that she develops. And one of them will be particularly important, as we'll see. Okay? She also, the photographer's like her. This is a, a Lottie Jacobi image. There are thousands of these postcards. One of the ways I first got into uh, learning about her. Okay, uh, here's a Dorothy Wilding picture taken shortly after Anna Wong's mother is killed in a car accident. Okay, uh, this one I like particularly because of the hand gestures in it. It's just a, a postcard that was sold at the time. Okay, uh, here's another. Here's one by E.O. Hoppe, who was a, a very well-known photographer of, of the era. Okay. The erotic images that she, uh, these things were also sold in China, which didn't help her reputation with the, uh, the nationalists. Okay? I've always liked this one in particular. This is from The Daughter of the Dragon. Her hit movie that she makes with Sesu Hayakawa uh, and with Warner Olin upon her return to the States in 1931. It's a big budget movie. Uh, and she does very well in the fashionable quality here, as, as you can see, quite extraordinary. And uh, here's the one by Lottie Jacobi. Okay, and then this one, fine. This is a little bit later, 1935. Anybody seen this picture, this, uh, this dress before? Pardon? You haven't seen It's owned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And when they had uh, an exhibit a couple of years ago on dresses, this triple dragon dress uh, was one of the main attractions. And I, when the Met has its uh, Asian female dress exhibit, opening, I think, next April or so like that. I'm sure that this one, made by uh, the famous uh, uh, designer uh, Todd Banton, will be one of the feature things. Here she's learning to do the Apache dance. Uh, pardon? Todd Banton? Hey, um, so, the, you know, this, she captures the eye of a generation of, of photographers. Okay. This man, Eric Mashwitz, is perhaps the ultimate love of her life. Okay. Uh, he was a BBC uh, commentator, lyricist. He writes the famous song, These Foolish Things Remind Me of You, okay, for Anna May. Uh, they meet in 1933. He comes to visit her in Hollywood. She takes him to her family. You know, she shows him around Los Angeles. And then finally he leaves and they never see each other again. So her personal life is very much of a tragedy, but he gave her joy, for, at least for a time. Okay. Uh, still, Hollywood is this. This is a yellow face. This is actually a woman dressing up at a party uh, as Anna Mae Wong. And Anna Mae Wong's influence on fashion is, is fairly significant. There was the Wong look, which was popular in England between 1931 and about 1935, bangs. Edith Head, the famous designer, uses the bangs for her permanent look. And she's, of course, very close friends with, with Anna Mae. Okay. Um, meanwhile, Anna Mae keeps going back and doing movies like this, Chu Chin Chow. Uh, and this movie deeply influenced Anna Sway in her fall 2014 collection. And she definitely attributes the inspiration for her current line uh, to, to this movie. So Anna Mae is in and out of Europe, going back to New York City, and she always stays at the Algonquin. She's very close friends with the, this photographer, Carl Van Vechten, who is the opera critic, first for the Vanity Fair, okay, then a salon keeper par excellence, to be invited to Carl Van Vechten's Central Park West party, which meant that you were with the tout monde. And this is where particularly young writers County Cullen, uh, Langston Hughes, and other Harlem Renaissance writers meet Alfred Knopf, the publisher, okay, and make contacts. Van Vechten was all about bringing together, people together. And one of his very favorite people, and the first person that he takes photographs of, is Anna Mae. Okay? And she's a perennial at his party whenever she comes into town. And there we see her meet talking with Frederick March, or was Zorl Neil, Neil Hurston. Okay. The people that Van, that Van Vechten brings together, one of the most amazing sources I found for all of this, uh, one afternoon I was doing some research up at the American Antiquarian Society and something else, but I knew that the Beinecke Library at Yale had a file 
And I called him up and I said, what do you got? And he said, oh, just a few pieces. I said, all right, I'll come down. So I think I went down on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock, and they brought out two thick file folders of letters by Anna May to Van Vechten. And of course, his responses, which the family probably has today. Okay? But they were correspondence from 1928 until her death in 1961. And even after that, Van Vechten, who was ever faithful, his collection of S letters is extraordinary. Okay? Uh, and despite the bad reputation he gets today because of the name of his novel, okay, uh, you know, he's somebody of just immense importance for artists during this period. And these kind of things, here we see Van Vechten on the left. Anna May always liked to show up at these parties in some kind of Chinese dress. That's Fanny Marinoff there on the right. That's Van Vechten's wife. And again, these were the top hosts of New York City. Uh, uh, in the 30s, right into the, into the 40s as well. Okay? Uh, and one of the photographers he meets there is Nicholas Murray. He took the preceding image, okay, and these color images, which are now up at the uh, uh, Eastman Kodak collection in Rochester. Okay? Now, 1935, Anna May has been in and out of the United States, okay? but she's aware of uh, the production of the most famous novel ever written by an American about China. I think it's still true. There has really never been an American who's come up to the level of Pearl Buck's The Good Earth. For all of the stereotypical qualities of it, okay, it's still a very powerful novel. And everybody understood that this was going to be the key role for any Asian star. Okay? And there were a lot of rumors that Anna Mae would get the part of Olan, the wife. She campaigned for it, you know, very secretly. Rob Wagner, who's a good friend of hers, has a very influential newsletter, says, how could we have anybody but Anna Mae Wong? Hedda Hopper argues the same thing, that Anna Mae Wong would be absolutely perfect for this role. And Anna Mae knew that this would be the role of a lifetime. Okay? Two forces uh, collided on this. First, MGM was really going to be very careful after the Shanghai Express incident not to offend the Chinese government. So they asked a man named T.D. Chung, who was a consul general in Los Angeles, what they thought of Anna Mae. And he said, people in China don't like her. Okay? They don't see her as a very good actress. They see her as embarrassing China. Okay? So that was a major strike. Okay? Then the casting agent, who was a German guy, decided that Anna Mae was too old, not that pretty. And when they cast Paul Muni, a very well-known actor, for the lead role, Anna Mae Long's chances were dashed completely because she, again, could not play opposite a Caucasian in a role like this. She could not be his wife, even if they never kissed. It could not be presented they would be in an intimate relationship. So Luz Rayner, and we'll see another image of her here, okay, who had won the Oscar for the great Ziegfeld the year before, gets cast as this part. I find The Good Earth, which again remains one of the, if not the most important movie ever made by an American film company about China, okay, to be a yellow-faced disaster. Okay. The accent that Luz Rainer, who's a very talented, wonderful person, has combines Yiddish and gibberish. Okay. Right. Uh, there's, uh, and Muni is not a whole lot better. There's none of the expressiveness that Anna May could have been brought to the part. Now, when I first published the book, uh, Richard Gottlieb, uh, who is a uh, pretty well-known critic, writes for the New York Review of Books, this is now, a, writes for Time Magazine, a, reviewed my book and another book that was done at the same time, and said, uh, these guys are wrong to complain about Anna Mae not getting the part. A, she wasn't that good, Gottlieb argued. Muni would never have accepted her as a co-star. However, Suzanne already mentioned a number of the stars that she had played opposite. Lon Chaney, Douglas <coughs> Fairbanks Jr., Joan Crawford, Ramon Navarro, Werner Oland, Marlene Dietrich. The list goes on of A-list actors with whom Anna Mae had played equally. Okay. To my mind, there's no doubt that Anna Mae could have carried the role and done marvelously 
And then she would not have been forgotten. And she would not have been pushed into the dustbin of history by politics. We'd have known far more about her. than My biography, which comes out in 2004, probably would have been preceded by a biography 50 years before. Okay. But I th and yet we still get today with someone like Gottlieb publishing the New York Review of Books, the newspaper of the intelligentsia, okay, a sense that anime was just not good enough. And I think that's really, really terribly wrong. Okay. Well, anime doesn't get the part. So what she does is she goes to China. She'd never been there before. She takes along a man named Newsreel Wong. If you've ever seen the famous picture of a child crying on the tracks in Shanghai, he's the guy that does that. He is a staff photographer for the Hearst newspapers. And this image, this uh, uh, short clip that I'll give to you, this is anime in Shanghai Harbor. Okay. She designs the cap. She designs her dress. Okay. She's speaking to reporters who will say things like, we notice you don't have a boyfriend with you. We notice you have wrinkles in your eyes. What about the roles you play? And very patiently, she deals with them. And little by little, by answering all of their questions, by trying to work with them, she wins them over. That and the fact that Wellington Kuo, China's ambassador to England, invites her the first night to a party. Melan Fan walks through the streets with her. Okay. Hu Die, Butterfly Wu, the leading Chinese actress of the time, openly befriends her. And these things turn the tide so that Anna Mae is accepted in China, whereas before she had been political poison. Okay. So we'll see, see more if you were she's very big on mink coats. Um, so okay. and then um, pardon? This is 1936. Okay. I'm go a little further on this. See her on the streets. Uh, Shanghai doesn't have a lot of cars at the time, so there she is outside of uh, the Sassoon Hotel. Now, the Peace Hotel, which is right down at the Bund. Anime always stayed in the top places. Okay. We see her sort of being a female flaneur, a flaneus. Okay. Walking through the streets, learning about Shanghai. Perhaps a tourist, but at the same time, someone who absorbs. She learns a lot of Chinese. She buys an immense number of dresses. Okay. This is her brother, who was teaching there in the university. Of course, she paid for his education. Not the oldest brother. Hmm? No, this, no, 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 this is a younger, younger brother. Pardon? No, no, not, not, not the half brother. This is another one. She pays for the education of all of her family and buys them houses, too. Except the oldest brother, who is not her I mean, the, Well, no, he pays, she pays for a lot of him, too. Wang Junan, he pay, she pays for him to go to Wasita. No, she, she, now here she, we see her walking through the market. Okay. These films were sent back to the States and would be seen on Saturday afternoons okay, by Americans uh, so they could keep up with her just as the good earth, of course, is becoming the year. And I'm going to skip a little bit ahead here. Oh, here she is. This is uh, anime uh, showing, uh, appearing with, with Houdie, with uh, Butterfly Wu. Does this have a soundtrack? But, no, it does not. Okay. Now, when she gets back to the States, she's determined to play roles that are friendly to China. She wants to have roles in which, even if she has to die at the end, that she still will have a substantial presence. She plays doctors. Okay. Uh, this is King of China with Akim Tamarov. Okay. These are B movies, it's true, and she plays, does about three or four of these. Dangerous to Know with Gail Patrick, again with Tamarov. Okay. You notice Anthony Quinn plays a bit role down the part. Okay. Okay. And then Island of Lost Men, in which she actually sings a song I, I thought about bringing that along, but I didn't think her voice was all that great. So, uh, and with J. J. Carol Nash. Okay. And then finally, this one here, Bombs Over Burma, okay, uh, which she does in World War II. Okay, uh, and it's a really kind of an interesting movie where she actually speaks Chinese for about the first 10 minutes. Okay. Now, um, Anna May 
suffers an enormous loss in reputation at a very, during a very famous event. Okay. Madame Chiang Kai-shek comes to the United States in 1943 because America and China are wartime allies. Okay. And the United States backed the nationalist government against the communists. Okay. All the communists and nationalists are working together against the Japanese. Okay. But Madame Chiang Kai-shek comes to rally American support and also to lobby for the end of the Chinese Exclusion Act. She makes a very famous appearance before Congress and is widely applauded. Okay. She then goes across the country, spends a lot of time in New York. Eventually, before she leaves, there's a huge rally for her at the Hollywood Bowl. And all of the big executives there, many leading stars are there. One person is decidedly not invited, and that's Anna May. Okay. Despite the fact that she spent the previous five or six years working very hard for China, United China Relief, the agency to send supplies and food and money over to China, that she openly had gone around to the troops and entertained them in the United States and Canada. She'd done a great deal. She had a big auction of all of the, of the gowns that she bought in uh, China to go for United China Relief. She really dedicated herself to the wartime cause. But in the mind of Madame Chiang Kai-shek, Anna May was the bad old past. She was the weak, sexually available woman that the nationalist government did not want to see as personifying China. And what I argue in the book, and I think it's very true, is that from henceforth, Anna May Wong's reputation and memory takes a sharp nosedive. It's true that she's now almost 40, and in the uh, cruel calculus of Hollywood, getting too old to be a star. Okay? As well, there, weren't that, there wasn't that much interest in films with Asian themes in the late 40s to begin with. It was 1950s. She is considered uh, by, in 1959 for the Flower Drum Song, but unfortunately she was too, too ill. She has a fair amount of television. Sadly enough, her bad habits caught up with her and she suffers terrible bouts of cirrhosis to the liver. Okay? Uh, and so you see her in the television programs of the 1950s, that once great beauty now has faded. Okay? Uh, and she's barely able to carry the roles. Plus, the, the Muto's are so crudely racist. They're really unwatchable today. Okay? And eventually, Anna Mae Wong dies in 1961 at 56, years and years younger than the rest of her siblings, with the exception of Mary, who committed suicide in 1940, uh, at the age of about 30. Okay? But all the others live into their 80s and 90s. Anna Mae leaves an estate of about $100,000 cash, okay? a home in uh, Brentwood, okay? which she gives to her younger brother, Richard, who sort of became her surrogate son, if you will, after the death of, uh, of her mother. Okay? She lived very, very well. She saved. Okay? And you can contrast her with someone like Louise Brooks. And a great actress at the time, who literally dies in, in his squalor. But Anna Mae persevered despite the fact that and when she was interviewed in the late 1940s, she referred to the good earth as the greatest disappointment of her career. Okay. And as well, Chinese Americans, film scholars, sort of pushed her into the background. Not thought of. Curiously enough, the people who kept her alive, and I talk about this in the book, are gay men. Okay, who valorized her. They thought she was, they sort of thought she was campy, so, so bad that she was good. Andy Warhol was a big, big fan of hers. Ray Johnson, for whom there's a current exhibit at one of the galleries here in town, had a correspondence club devoted to Anna Mae Wong. Okay, uh, and she's very big in the chorus line, a number of other uh, key cultural artifacts of gay American last uh, 50 years. Okay, uh, so they could have kept her alive. And what I found is that while older leftists disdained her, okay, while older nationalist Chinese also were ashamed of her, she's buried in a grave with her, with her mother. Her name is on the side only in Chinese characters. Okay. Uh, she doesn't have a big mausoleum. Okay. It's a small grave uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a fairly small uh, cemetery. Okay. But her impact is big. Really, she crystallizes all of the big questions we have about Asian American actresses ever since. And the question often comes up, why aren't things better now? 
And they're a little better, that's for sure. Okay. But we see the similar kind of struggles that Lucy Liu has to go through, a very talented, intelligent person okay, who always has to play secondary roles, who never has to retreat to television or to get the big parts. Okay. And there aren't really a number of Asian American stars who are really beginning to get ready. There are, they're, they're in repertory. The time will be coming. What I argue, and I'll leave you with this, is that Asian American actors are in the same position that African American actors were in 30 years ago. Pushed to the margins, not visible in the media. When blacks began pounding on the door and demanding things and gaining more political rights, things are not perfect for black actors today. And there still is missing that big strata of character actors who make the lesser part of these. But we do have, you know, Denzel Washington, Samuel Jackson, uh, and, and any number of other well-known lead stars who would not have been present there 30 years ago, but political power pushed them forth so they could display their talents and America could enjoy them. And when we do that happens, all of the Asian American actors will look back and there'll be anime far, far in front of them, always guiding them, showing them the way. Thank you. Um, we got some questions, right? All right, come on, New York, let's hear it. Yes. I'm on now. In the Shanghai Express. Yeah. Where they're in the same car. Yeah. Relationship, right. yes. I'm wondering, to your knowledge, at the time that that movie would have been shown in the theaters of America, in say Peoria, yeah. would an audience member have picked up on that? Uh, probably not. Okay, let me let me just repeat the question. The question is, would an audience member have picked up on on what? And, uh, would, they, would would an audience have picked up on the relationship between Dietrich and Wong? I kind of oh, doubt it. Okay. Um, I, you know, gay themes are, you know, very, very sub rosa in those days. Okay? Uh, but Dietrich's relatives saw the two of them. They re recorded that uh, Wong and Dietrich would, had a tent by themselves during the making of the movie. They usually sat together playing music, uh, drinking lime rickies together, sort of ignoring everybody else. It didn't pay any attention to, to Clive uh, Brooks, the, the male actor. They're sort of off in their own little world. Okay. Uh, at the same time, uh, one time someone asked Dietrich what he thought of Anna May's acting in that scene, and uh, there was a chill in the room, as if Dietrich somehow didn't want the suggestion that there would be competition. So I mean, it's a complex relationship. And of course, Dietrich is one of the great icons mm -hmm of the 20th century. And you, I, I argue in the book that there's a clear racial choice which is being made there. Okay. I think you were for next. Yeah. I've read both Black and Zero's and Black and I was interested in her vaudeville activity in the United States. Mm -hmm. but you hadn't no, I didn't talk about that. I'm sorry. OK. Um, so you want to know about her vaudeville activity in the United States? Yeah. OK. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I left that out because I was kind of getting out the other thing. She does tour first in 1925. It's not a success. Okay. Um, but she continues it. And then she does most of her vaudeville in Europe. She does do vaudeville in New York City and in Brooklyn okay, during the early 1930s. Uh, very similar to what she does in, in, in Europe. Okay. But was it for white audiences or was it like the Chitlin Circuit? Was no, it, it was for white, aud white audiences. Well, yes, it would be, it was yeah. Yes, I understand that, yeah. No, she was really, in, she, was, she was in Radio City Music Hall. She was in Broadway theaters. Um, so, two problems. One is, why her? And two, what do you mean? Why choose her? Why did she become ah. a big female Chinese yeah, star sure. in the early days when there may have been other options? And can you talk about her childhood experience and let her on the road to being a theater person? Sure. Okay. Uh, let me take the first part first. 
so do you want to repeat the question? I'll, I'll repeat it. Okay. The question, there are two parts of the question. First of all, what are her childhood experiences that get her prepared for a career in the cinema? Uh, and then secondly, the very interesting question, why her? Okay. Um, I think that she was prepared.